for being, being here today um, to First Sun EAP's presentation of the power of potential. And before I open up to the slides, I want everybody to kind of at least see names. I would love it if y'all could show faces. Um, and, you know, I won't go do introductions of everybody, but I do want to introduce myself as well as Maria Lund um, and also um, Lisa Hardy. So I am Lucy Henry. I am the Vice President of Stakeholder Relations for First Sun EAP. I have been with First Sun for 22 years and my, you know, my main role at First Sun is, is really to be the, the relationship person to benefit consultants. Um, so I love trying to get in front of y'all and just tell you, you know, who we are and help you understand a little more about EAP and how First Sun EAP might be the right fit for your customer. And so today, you know, we're really looking at, um, you know, this is not going to be a sales song and dance so much as it is just looking at behavioral health and the, uh, where behavioral health is and then some of our suggestions. I'm gonna let Maria Lund introduce herself um, and then Lisa, let Lisa Hardy introduce herself. Thank you, Lucy. Welcome everyone, I'm Maria Lund with First Sun EAP. I'm the president and COO and we're really excited to do this presentation because it's really important to us to look at what's going on, you know, in behavioral health in the workplace. You know, it's what we're all about, what we've been doing for 30 years and, you know, with the pandemic, so many things have changed. The whole field has changed. And so we're really watching closely, you know, what's happening in the news, what's happening in the workplace, what's happening with all of our colleagues. And of course, we're looking at what's happening in our So We're excited to share that with you today, just to see what we're seeing and what we're learning and to kind of collaborate with you and, and how to move forward. So welcome. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for um, being here and letting me join Maria, Lucy. Thank you guys. Um, I'm Lisa Hardy. I'm with for Sun EAP. Um, I serve as our vice president over our direct services team. So I lead those folks that are directly handling um, the intake calls from the employees, from the covered member, um, as well as our team that really specializes in those risk related um, events and those workplace management where there's such an impact um, in the workplace based on what's going on with the individual. So glad to be here and um, look forward to future opportunities to get to know people. We appreciate you being here. So would love for y'all to, to pop in the chat and just say kind of what you would love to get out of today. Um, one of the, the requirements, at least for South Carolina CE credit, and I am going to figure out how to get North Carolina CE credit, um, is that you are interactive. So we'll have some polls, have some chat questions. Um, but before I pull up the screen, I don't know that I can see the chats afterwards, but I would love for you just to be able to say, you know, what, what you would like to take away from today. Um, but as I'm doing that, as, we're, as you're doing that, let me just kind of tell you why we are doing this. And you know what we're hoping to accomplish, in that you know it's it's really about understanding the importance that behavioral health, um, which is really more than mental health, has in the workplace. You know we know that so much has changed over the last two years, and we're really seeing the need for more behavioral health services. So we're going to really look at that today, but we're also looking. At, you know, one of the things that we are doing is doing the kind of um, paradigm shift of the initials of employee assistance program to everyone at potential. And that is our focus for today, is how do we, how, how do we utilize and promote the resources so that everyone can be their very best selves, especially in the workforce, because EAP is focused on the workforce. You as benefit consultants are focused on the workforce. So how can we get everyone to be at potential? What are the tools and resources that are available to get them? Not just the employees or the members, but the workplace leaders and the entire work organization. 
So we're looking at really kind of moving everyone from what we like to say, um, languishing. I think of languishing as that upside down turtle, but also to, to be in, to flourishing, to be in their very best selves and utilizing all that's available to them so that they can be their very best. So we're looking at, you know, again, I don't want this to be so much a first Sun EAP sales presentation, though we are going to talk a lot about some of the things that First Sun has done. Um, but for you to be able to have the tools to be able to really analyze well-being partners like First Sun EAP and how you might promote them within um, the groups that you are working. So I appreciate those of you that have put in the chats. And um, again, like I said, we've got some polls coming up. So we'd love for you to participate in those polls. So I'm gonna share my screen and let us get started. Of course, with the sharing, I have to do all the other things that we, that we go in here. So hoping that you are seeing this. Um, so we're looking at the power of potential. And when you think about potential, what does that really mean? I mean? We've talked about being your very best self, but how do we rise above? How do we begin to help those that are really struggling have what they need so that they can rise and be their very best selves? So in doing that, we begin to look at just the problem, the problem of COVID-19 and the fact that so many folks are struggling. You know, we are hopefully beginning to emerge from this pandemic. And in that, we're looking at a pandemic of another kind. Employee mental health and well being is dropped to alarmingly low levels. It has become imperative, and we say that, you know, with lots of emphasis for employers to begin to address this low level of well-being to keep their businesses running because that's where it's really struggling. These businesses are struggling with their bottom line. So Stephen Taylor, who wrote a book that actually came out in March of 2020, um, just in time for us to all get shut down with a pandemic. So he wrote a book called The Psychology of a Pandemic. And what he wrote in that is that the mental health footprint of a pandemic is larger than the medical footprint. And this is really where we are now. It's what we are seeing. Everywhere we go, employers are short staffed, service is slow, it's problematic, shelves are empty, performance is stunted, and initiatives are stalled. We're seeing that everywhere we go. And what we are also seeing is that those mental health issues to see where my there we go is that the mental health issues are you know really rate being raised so we bought what once was a really small group of employees that needed services to support their mental health has really climbed to over a quarter of the population when we count the number of people who are basically not performing they're languishing or they're subpar relative to the COVID-19 status we see that those numbers are exploding. You know, all of this personal struggles really create the bottom line issues for the workplace. So what we begin to see is that the circle of well-being and all that are stressed beyond their coping skills, the number soar. We've gone from COVID-19 to stress 22. So I'm going to turn it over to Maria to talk a little more about Stress 22. Thank you, Lucy. So yes, yeah, so what do we mean when we say COVID-19 to Stress 22? So if you think about what Lucy just said about the mental health footprint being so much larger than the medical footprint, Think back to a real life situation. For example, think back to Easter day and in the Columbiana Mall, there was a shooter that came in and started firing in the crowd. 
So you have a medical footprint of people who are actually hit by a bullet. But think about the mental health footprint. We're talking to people that were hit by a bullet. We're talking about their family members. We're talking about all the people who were in the mall that ran for their lives. We're talking about all the people who maybe were going to go to the mall that day, who think, my goodness, I was supposed to be in the mall that day. We think about all the people that maybe had a similar sort of situation or near miss in their past. So that's what we're talking about. We've got a pandemic that hits that, that affects a certain number of people who actually become ill with the virus or who lose a family member for the virus. And then we talk about all the ripple effects that go out. That's where we are this year. It's, it's what we're calling stress 22. And just like COVID-19, I think stress 22 is gonna go many years after the initial stress. So what First Done does is that we like to look at all the research, we like to look at surveys, uh, and we pair that with what's happening in our own business. This data that you see in front of you is from the MetLife study that was done at the end of 2021. And here's something that I want you to see in the data. So if you look at the top balloons there, you see that 26% of the people are looking for help. 22% of the people are saying they're depressed more than half the time. That's clinical right there. So just to put this in perspective, research says that about 20% of the population in any given time, this is the workplace population, so working individuals, might have behavioral health issues. What we're looking at is so much more because of course that 20% don't always go for help. So if you look at the bottom balloons, now you're looking at the population that actually sits there with that problem. So if you're an employer, you're looking at more than a third of your employee population stressed more than half the time. You're looking at more than a third of your population burned out more than half the time. The fact that we've got 26% of the people reaching out for help is huge. I can tell you from our book of business that it's double. Double the number of people calling us and they're calling us to get services and they're seeing more sessions, they're using more services. The need is out there. But what's so important is that not, not everybody's reaching out. And even those people that are reaching out, sometimes they're reaching out to services that aren't so helpful. Maybe they're going to an app that's not particularly effective, or maybe they're going to something and, you know, they have a session and it's not so great, or they can't find a counselor. There are a lot of things that can go wrong in the process. So that's the employee perspective. Let's look at the employer perspective. So from the employer perspective, this is that same MetLife study that was done at the end of last year. This represents what the C-suite is worried about. So if you think about it, the C-suite is really worried about their employee population. I mean, this is not just like I'm a nice person and I wanna take care of my employees, but remember that prior slide, a third of my employees are burned out a third of my employees are not able to do their work because mental health and well being is getting in their way or lack of well being. So 74% are worried about the well being, 70% are worried about mental health, stress, and burnout. And what about that middle number, that 71%? Well, what's going on there? And if you notice the wording, this is remote work capability. This is not like, do we have Zoom or do we have the technological capability to do this? This is like, I'm worried as a C-suite person that are my people able to do remote work? You know, and kind of prior to 2020, there were a lot of executives and leaders that would say, you know, I'm not sure I want my people to go home. I'm not sure that they'll be productive. You know, maybe they'll be, you know, not paying attention to work or whatever. 
Well, now we've shown that it can be done, but is it being done? Now, here's what's going on. I mean, people are at home and how many of them are experiencing conflict with their children or with their spouses? We've seen so many more calls come in with marital conflict, family conflict. I mean, these people are in the house together. You know, the workplace has come home now. We see people drinking and using substances. You know, I'm, I'm feeling stressed out. So, hey, you know, the liquor cabinet's just downstairs. Um, what's in this coffee cup that I'm drinking? There's a lot more substance use going on. What about focus? I mean, if, if people were worried about focus before, what about focus now? When I'm having to pay attention to my children who maybe are home, or I'm having to pay attention to my bills that I'm not able to pay. The focus also comes into attention because there's a communication issue. Now I have to figure out how to communicate with all of my colleagues. I have to sort of intentionally communicate with them to see where I am because they're not in the office with me anymore. There's a whole different pattern of work that I need to learn to be capable to work remotely. So this is all that we're concerned about in the C-suite. This is what the employers are seeing as the problem. Let's, let's take a poll. What are you hearing? What are you seeing in your customers' workplaces right now? Um, so if you could answer this question. Can y'all see it? So you can see this. Um, interestingly enough, work-life balance is probably what most of you are, 74% of you said work-life balance, but you're also seeing the depression, anxiety, and the turnover, as well as productivity changes. Um, so all of those things, um, you know, we are seeing, and, you know, we do, all of those things are there, but we are certainly seeing the productivity and the turnover um, depression and the anxiety um, in the midst of all of this. And it does, it takes a toll on the bottom line of the workplace. So how do we, you know, what are those consequences? Well, the consequences, you know, are all of these things. And um, the poor customer service is very much important. Again, the impact of the pandemic um, of poor mental health and well-being is significant to the bottom line of employers. So the consequences have immediate as well as long-term financial impact. So addressing this wave of mental health across the workplace is something that so many employers really aren't prepared to do. They're not able to effectively address this because most don't really have the leadership expertise what are the correct partner resources to support employees at this level? So again, how do we bring them to that place of flourishing, to that place of really being at their the potential? And how we do that is to be able to invest in the comprehensive support and knowing as consultants how to say, you know, these are the things that you really need to be looking at, is that you want your employees to be resilient, 
and productive, but you, and you also just can't sit back and watch while this happens. You've got to bring in the resources. So to be able to look at the tools that are there. Because the reality is employers are changing their approach to benefits. You know, they're looking at more customization. They're looking at emerging benefits. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second as well as increasing benefit communication. So many of you said, how do we communicate about EAP? But they're offering more value added services um, and especially more mental health programs. But there's a lot of questions out there as to, you know, how do I make those decisions? And there's a lot of communication about a lot of different benefits. There's um, a lot, billions of, of venture capital that's being put into the mental health market. But how valuable is all that venture capital into these programs? Is it really about sales or is it about caring for the employees? So it's hard for, for you as a consultant as well as employers to know where to turn. Um, so we actually at First Son have been tracking this trend externally with our own business. Our um, standalone EAP sales have actually more than doubled in 2021 um, over the prior three-year average. And actually some about 37% of our customers are actually asking for more than what we consider to be our standard EAP model, which is three sessions. So they're seeing the need to provide more services to their employees and being able to help them to understand how to invest is really about helping defray health care costs as well. So as a benefit consultant, I've got another poll for you. You know, what are your customers asking for? We'll throw that next poll up and see what, what they're asking for. So what do you, what are you at? What are you hearing? Let's look at this. You know, again, access to providers is probably the top one for you, but then the affordable and no hidden fees and being responsive, as well as personalized services um, is, is so very important. So you're seeing these things. So Maria, I want you to talk about partners. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> Okay, so we've seen the problem. I mean, I think all of you pretty much know about the problem, but we wanted to kind of line it out for you and show some specifics and really give it the context of, you know, this is um, a problem that's been around for a long time. There's always been an issue with people that maybe don't have good well being or have issues with mental health, but it's really at a crisis stage now. Um, so what you wanna do is find a partner or partners to help be the solution. So what we're gonna offer here is some information here about um, kind of what we're seeing and how we vet partners. Um, you know, we look at other EAPs because we are part of the National Behavioral Consortium and that's a best practice group of EAP providers. So we look a lot at what's best practice, what are top tier kinds of things. And we do vet a lot of partners because in our service, if you look at our logo, we've got our son in the middle, that's us. And we've got a lot of partners around the outside to sort of complement our service. So what I'm gonna do here is kind of talk about what we go through. And this is sort of 
some guidance, if you will, about how to vet a partner. You know, we do a lot of this with our customers and our clients, you know, when they call and they want to see a clinician, we'll oftentimes say, here's how to talk to a clinician or here's, here's how to shop a clinician. Um, so I'm telling you, here's what we do. So first of all, whenever we're looking for a partner, and here's what I would encourage you to do is to think about first, what do you want? I mean, there's no one partner that's going to be good for everybody. We certainly are not good for everybody. First son does not do national, international business. Um, we don't work typically really well with super huge organizations. There are companies that are going to be good for different kinds of things. So start out with what is your group looking for? What are their needs? And then go shopping for a partner. When we're looking at a partner, this slide here talks about the first thing that we look at, and that is who is the partner. We look at the who before we look at the what. And if you listen to one of my sales presentations, we always start with our who. Who are we? But that's important with mental health because, you know, beyond the sale, you really want to know, like, what's going to happen. So we look first to see, I mean, is your business about well-being and mental health or is it about money? I mean, Lucy said just a little while ago that there's a whole lot of venture capital coming into the well-being market. And we have been doing this for 30 years. And we can tell you that if you're into getting people from A to Z and mental health, it's not a huge money-making business. So there may be ways to make more money than we do, and that's great. But look at why are the people in the business? If they're in to make a buck, then that's probably not a partner you want to choose. If, if they can talk to you about what they're really trying to do and why they're really trying to do it, that that's part of who they are, then that's, that's a good point. And then you want to look at, can they tailor services? Are they flexible in their contracting? You want to figure out, is this a big, huge company that is going to do a cookie cutter approach and do it the same way every time? Because if so, maybe that formula is perfect. But again, like I said, probably not for your whole book of business. You might want to reshop it each time if that's the case. We want to look for people that are creative problem solvers. You know, we're talking here about the wave of mental health that's coming out in 2022. At the end of the year, even six months from now, it's going to be different. And next year, it's going to be different. We want somebody who can change with the times and adapt with whatever the problems of the day are in the workplace. We like to know if they've got a proven track record. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to work with somebody who's new. There's a lot of new players in the market, but look at some sense of track record. I mean, surely if they've got a new platform and a new thing, they've probably got some sort of history of testing it. They've sure got some data behind it, something to tell you that this is good stuff. So make sure you ask for that. And then are they responsive? And what I mean by this is not just do they pick up the phone when you're trying to get them through the sales process, but what about after the sale? Every company is going to have a problem. Every group that's trying to work with mental health and well-being is going to drop the ball. We certainly drop the ball sometimes. So when that happens, are they responsive? If you have a hiccup and think, well, wait a second, how does this work with our health plan? Or wait a second, what about this? We change this. Does it work here? What about when there's a question? Is there going to be a human being that's available to you? Or do they have a good process to answer your questions? Are they responsive? And then the last thing is kind of, I've been even more worried about whether to put this on there or not, but it's something I certainly look for. And that's whether I think they have integrity. And a lot of that is, there's not like a clear question you can ask about that, but just looking, you know, does their talk match their walk? Does their product serve in the ways that they say they're trying to do good? And a lot of times I'll, I'll look at this by how they just talk to me. You know, if I'm asking a lot of questions about, well, why do you do it this way? And what about this? And what about this? If there's a defensiveness or, you know, this is just the way it's done, then, then that's really kind of a red flag for me. 
you should be able to have a discussion about the why and the who and have a really good engagement on that. Okay, next. So after we get the who down, then I'm gonna be all about looking at the what. What are the services that are needed? And Lucy went through kind of some of the things that we're seeing getting asked for. We do certain things. We ask our partners to do certain things. We see other EAPs do certain things. And this is kind of a list of stuff that we look for that I think is really good to have in a well-being partner. So first off, you wanna look for a broad array of services. So even if you have a point solution that comes in and says, yep, we do coaching, what you wanna do is think about, okay, well, sometimes coaching is not gonna fit the bill. And what happens if they start in coaching and then they need something else? Look for a broad array of services or a way to connect to those services so that your people don't get stuck or lost. Look for that responsiveness that I was just talking to, you know, access to a real person, not just at the sale and not just when there are problems, but all through the system. You want your clients, the customer clients and their members to be able to get access to a person for help. Look for high retention rates. Now this is a really good quality measure and, and with any partner that we might work with, we're gonna look for um, references to kind of see like, what are your retention rates? I mean, even if they're new and they don't have much time to have retention rates, look for references. Who's used the service? What are they saying about you? And I don't know about you guys, but for our book of business, there are so many different customers and through 2020, 2021, and now people are so uncertain about the future of their business that they want different plan levels, they want different price points, they want the ability to tailor everything, let's put things in, let's take things out. In 2020, 2021, people were all about, hey, can we take out as much as possible because I have zero money right now. And right now we're seeing the opposite. Hey, can we add more stuff in because my people are hurting and we need everything, just throw everything at us, you know? So we want to have different price points, different services so that they match whatever the needs are of your customer. Another thing we get asked for is variable coverage periods. So this, this started mostly back in 2020 and 2021 where people would say, you know, I mean, I don't even know if our company is going to be here in six months. So I don't want to tie myself into a year long contract. I mean, can we just do this for three months or six and then we'll see where we are. I think it's reasonable to ask for those kinds of things. Ask for what you want. We also have varying pricing models and rate guarantees. I think this is a fair thing to ask of any vendor. Um, like the pricing models, we have some customers that'll say, well, um, you know, we've got to do our budget in August and we've got to write a number in and we've got to know what that number is. We can't go off that number. We've got other groups that'll say, well, we're pretty worried that not very many people are going to use services. So, hey, we only want to pay for what we use. Um, so we're, we've got pricing points in different ways. And even if a vendor comes to you and says, hey, this is our way to do it, it's reasonable to ask for variations if, if you want it. And rate guarantees, you know, I think that that's just um, something to look at with every vendor too and with the situation. Of course, if you have um, like a, a variable situation where you're saying let's use uh, only what people, let's, let's get charged only for what people are using. You probably don't want a rate guarantee there, but if you're locking in a number, you might want that rate guarantee. Next slide. Hit miss. You have to hit, hit, hit this thing twice. <laughs> I know. So here, okay, so here are a few more things. Um, and then I wanna pause for a minute when I'm done just to see if there are questions about these things. I wanna make sure they make sense. So I saw that a lot of people hit affordable for, you know, the concerns that are coming across from customers. And everybody, of course, wants the lowest cost option. That's a good one. But I want to say that um, just to look at everything, because sometimes there are hidden fees. And there's a couple of ways that that's showing up um, that I want you to look for. One is that 
um, especially kind of with platforms and things that sometimes they'll say, well, there, there are so many sessions and you can do it this way, but then beyond that, there might be a member fee or something. And, and that's okay. I mean, if there's a member fee, that's a reasonable form of business, but you just want to know that. You want to know that up front. Another way that hidden fees can pop up is if you have, um, for example, a lot of EAPs do this. If you have an EAP that says, okay, well, there are one to six sessions or something, but then they might refer right away to the health plan. Well, if that happens, then that cost is going to show up on the behavioral health side of your health plan. So the cost is still going to come right at the employer. It's just going to come from a different place. So you really kind of want to know what's going on there. Easy exit from service is something that's reasonable to ask for. Um, a lot of groups typically will contract for one year, sometimes two, three, whatever. But um, sometimes an employer might want to get out of the contract. Now, most every contract would come in with some sort of service guarantee that would say, well, if we fall down on service, then you can quit. But hey, what if the company just changes? And that's a reality that every business is facing right now with not being able to get people um, to work. They can't hire enough people. And they've got, you know, like I said, a third of the people that are, you know, fumbling around worrying about their well-being and mental health. Some companies might just need to quit because they just need to quit. It has nothing to do with the service. So you want to be able to ask for that. And then complimentary service discounts, that's something that you can ask for. It's a nice thing that we do whenever we work with partners. We say, hey, part of being a partner with us means that you're going to give our customers a discount. So I think you can ask, you know, hey, if we're giving you a big piece of business, can we get something here? So don't be afraid to negotiate all that. You probably already do. And then the last two things are really important. And we did get a chat question about that, that it's reasonable and necessary for any well-being or mental health service to blend with the health plan. There should be some way that they can integrate because there's a big spend on that health plan side. And what you don't want to do is have silos where there are things going on and things aren't blending. So make sure that they can blend and that, you know, one can refer to the other. Same with other services. You know, we see a lot of customers that will have things in place like a Dave Ramsey program or something, and they're really wedded to that. It's a good program. So if they've got that in place and they've spent money and resources on it, they have some faith in it, you want to have your well-being vendor or your mental health vendor knowing about that so that they can refer to it. You want to be able to use that. You don't want customers and members having so many things in so many different directions that they don't know which way to turn. So that's the end of, of that stuff. And before we go to the next one, I'd love just to see, are there any questions that people want to ask out loud or put in the chat? about any of that? Look at my chat. See anything. Oh. All right, so we've talked about partners at Potential and we've started out talking about kind of employees and employers. So let's look at just employees and what employees are really looking for. You know, when the right solution is in place and a good well-being partner um, has been chosen, then employees begin to reach their potential. They begin to grow in their own well-being. We looked at those challenges and what we're wanting to do is address those challenges. And as we address those challenges, then the anxiety, the depression, the burnout begin to dissipate. So we really are looking at the resources to help employees be at potential. So what are employees looking for? What do they want in that well-being partner? Well, you know, look, the first thing that they want is just those personalized services, things that are actually meant for them, that they can really find. Um, and they want the, to know that people, somebody's actually being caring about them and they're giving them attention, or maybe they're not. You know, maybe they just want to be able to, to get the resources and go on. Um, but they also want to be able to choose how they access services, whether it be through an online portal, whether it be actually in seeing a clinician um, in person or face-to-face -face or um, through a video app or maybe text or chat um, is what they want to do. So they want to be able to choose that modality. 
Um, one of the things that we are seeing, and I think this goes along with self-directed health care, is that um, employees really want to be able to have a choice in the providers that they see. You know, at First Sun EAP, one of the things that we've always said is we want to put um, the right clinician with the client that calls in. But we're beginning to see that sometimes, you know, our choice for them is not what they want. They want to see, you know, A, B, C, D of choices and let me pick that person. So our even having to pivot a little bit and look at how we do those choices. But when they're also looking for services to help all of their needs. So EAP is not just about the counseling aspect of things, but it's looking at other needs, um, such as you know, work-life services. And that's one of the things that we're seeing. But what they're also seeing, as Maria talked about, you know, wanting to be able to transition to their health plan if possible. They've seen a clinician for as many, many sessions as they can um, through their EAP, but they want to stay with that clinician. How can they do that? They want to be able to go and, and access self-help and do things. But they want things to be easy to use. Um, but the most important thing in that is that they really want more and more of the what we call work-life services or life management services. Um, and they want a partner that can do that. So one of the things that we are seeing is that uh, over almost three quarters of employees are ranking life management benefits among their top five desired benefits. And again, this is coming from that MetLife survey. And then almost half of employers say that they plan to invest, invest in more work-life management, meaning financial, legal services, um, even elder care and child care. So because that's where the work-life balance comes in. And they really, these services have come into a scene in a big way especially with this working from home and remote work and children being sent home and having to educate at home. So I'm sure many of you had to, had to have that struggle as well um, at the beginning of the pandemic and learning how to manage that. But having the resources to find childcare or even older adult care or just looking for um, ways to, to feed your family and get groceries. So concierge services, those kinds of things. So I know at First Son, we've actually seen our life management um, folks reaching out and utilizing life management rate rose by 37%. But there's also an issue. And, and that issue is, as we talked about, we talked about supply chain. I mean, that, that is the word for 2022, I believe, is that supply chain. But, you know, clinicians actually fall into that as well is that we have seen that there really is a shortage of mental health providers. Many counselors are retiring. You know, many have said, you know what, I don't wanna go back to in-person services. I wanna to continue to do video. And yet the employees are saying, I wanna see somebody in person. Um, many clinicians are also looking at their own work-life balance and they're limiting their practices um, so that they can preserve their own well-being. And you know, it's not uncommon for many practices to be full with a waiting list. And you know, one of the hardest things that we have to be able to say is, I'm sorry, but it's a two or three week wait. When somebody is seemingly in a mental health crisis and needs to see someone. So at first sign, you know, one of the things that we are really seeking to do is to find some creative responses to support clients. And in that we are working very closely with our clinical providers. Um, we do case consultations with them. Um, again, that's, it's not a supervision, but it's kind of a peer consultation, just about those sticky cases, but also to help them to see when there's an EAP case, to, to look at how the workplace is being impacted by that employer, by that employee's behavioral health issues. Um, we're also offering a lot of education um, to Clinicians typically like webinars like this. So every other month, we actually do kind of a, a two-hour roundtable training. Um, we're also seeking to just really recognize and appreciate um, clinicians that go out of their way. When we have many, many providers that um, have been with us for 30 years, and they're very loyal to us. 
but so that when we call and say, hey, we've got somebody that really needs to be seen, they will, you know, rearrange their, their schedule to be able to see somebody. Um, and again, that's how, how we appreciate them. We do a, a kudos certificate um, that we send out. It's an actual certificate that we mail. And we've had many clinicians that have actually framed it and put it on their wall. Um, but one of the other things that we are doing that a lot of other employee assistance programs aren't doing is that we're trying to bring in newly licensed providers in the pipeline. In South Carolina, we have licensed associates or professional counselors and marriage and family therapists. These are clinicians who have finished their, their graduate work and have graduated and taken their licensing exam, but they have to have so many hours of clinical practice as well as supervision in order to be fully licensed. And we decided this year that it's time to bring these people into the pipeline. Um, we're helping to educate them, but also helping them to get their hours. And they're often more accessible and they're being supervised. So they may not have 30 years of clinical experience, but a lot of them have, you know, had prior counseling experience like working in substance use or social work before they ever went back to get fully licensed. Um, the other thing that we are doing is participating with other top tier EAPs to share in the provider network, especially outside of South Carolina. And then of course, we're having to look at, um, occasionally having to pay more when needed you know, we would love to be able to bring everyone up to a pay, pay grade. Um, and when, when EAP um, can, we can get a whole lot more EAP sales, maybe we can do that. But again, we're trying to appreciate them and give them things that maybe aren't as monetary. So from employees, we go to leaders. And we'll give it back to Maria. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, so, okay, so we're just about to get to the bonus portion of the presentation. Because in most cases, we look at the solution provider and we look at the employees or members and we say, yes, let's get a solution provider to take care of the employees and people stop. What I'm about to tell you is that leaders are sort of the secret sauce of making everything work. What's going on? There's that old saying, I guess, uh, that you wouldn't need managers if things didn't change. If you think about 2020 and 2021, everything changed. Everything is changing now. So what happens is that you've got organizations that, lead, that need leaders more than ever. The problem is that leaders are not so good right now. And I can tell you that in you know, all my time doing EAP services, that in the last two years, I've had more leaders on the phone with me in tears saying, I really just don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to manage people in this kind of situation. There's no playbook for this. And the truth is, you know, that I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. Uh, there is no playbook for this. But what we're going to talk about here is how to bring leaders to potential, because that's either going to make or break the organization. So how do you do that? Let's look at what the leaders are facing in terms of challenges. So first off, I mean, leaders are employees too, right? So when we were looking at those numbers before about the number of people who are depressed or the number of people who are struggling, leaders are right there too. They have their own struggles. They're working at home and they're dealing with all the same things the employees are. The thing is that they also have to manage the employees who are not being productive or who are not able to do the things that they were able to do before and who are needing more attention than they needed before. They're having to deal with a whole redesigned workplace. You know, we've got people that are remote and we've got all new workflows and processes. I've got new policies and procedures. I've got to do things differently than I ever did before. So the complexity of everything has gone up for these leaders. They have to have new skills in order to work with the employees. These are kind of soft skills, you know, that, that leaders maybe didn't have before. 
that they have to be able to connect to employees in different ways. They have to look at employees that are maybe struggling with burnout and try to sort of bring them up. And this is not a skill that many leaders have. Meanwhile, as you well know, most workplaces are understaffed. You know, like Lucy was just talking about supply chain stuff. I mean, the great resignation, all of that. Pretty much every workplace you go into is understaffed. So you're asking those very same people that are staying behind who are less productive by nature to do more work. And then you're asking the managers to make it all happen. And then you've got an employer who probably has initiatives that they didn't get done in 2020 and 2021, trying to get all that done now in 2022 with managers who are stressed out and employees who are stressed out and not enough to do it. On top of that, and this was the one that got people crying and calling me, was that people are fighting with one another. People are just on their last nerve. And so if anybody says anything wrong or if a communication breaks down or somebody doesn't get something done when they're supposed to get it done, people are arguing and fighting and managers don't know how to deal with that. Next slide. Here's a slide that tells us something really interesting. In all the years that we've been around, we've been offering leader training. We've always offered this stuff. We've always known, hey, there's a, there's a real benefit to getting your leaders skilled up and on top of things. Very seldom did employers really step up to buy it. Even more seldom did leaders say, hey, I need it. But what's happening now is that leaders in droves are saying, we need help. They're saying we need training so that we can do the things that we now have to do that we have no idea how to do. They're saying, my goodness, my employees need training because they're trying to do things that they don't know how to do. Please don't make me get stuff done with employees who don't know what they're doing. They're saying, please have resources that I can point people to when they're struggling. 70% of the leaders are asking for help for themselves or their employees. 69% are saying, please get resources. The next slide. So what do you do? What, what do we do to try to help leaders become that beautiful secret sauce? Here are the things that we have seen work. So first off, you want to try to teach skills. And you know, in the past, people used to call these soft skills and they never ever wanted to pay for their employer, for their leaders to get these soft skill trainings, but now it's just necessary. So these are skills to just really connect with employees. I mean, number one, the employees are struggling and number two, they're not in the workplace. So you have to figure out not only how do I have empathy and communicate that, how do I communicate the complexity of all of our work changes over a Zoom meeting and how do I coach employees? You've got to do all that through Zoom meetings when I can't really lay eyes on people and see how they are. But all of these things, the empathy, communication, coaching are so important. I mean, you really just can't take a tired person and say, okay, get it done by Friday. You have to take that tired person and say, how can we get together and figure out how to get this done by Friday? I mean, it's just a really different approach that we need to teach leaders about. Um, and we've got a lot of leaders that were terribly successful before, but are not being successful now. They've got to map over all their skills onto this new kind of 2022 workplace. The second thing might seem obvious, but, but it isn't usually done. And that's really to help the leaders take care of themselves. You know, you, a lot of times you have servant leaders that say, well, you know, I'm gonna take care of everybody else. I'm not gonna focus on myself. That's not gonna work. We've gotta have leaders that take care of themselves and that use the resources because that's gonna translate so powerfully to the employees. They're gonna see, hey, my leader's going through this and they're taking care of themselves and it can be done. I like what I see. And they might even approach the leader and say, what are you doing? How are you staying? How do you keep a smile on your face? Because I feel miserable. 
So to be that model of self-care and action is really powerful in the workplace to get employees in. And we actually had a chat question about how to communicate benefits to employees. This is how to do it. If you can get leaders to use the benefits and this next bullet down to tell employees about it in the moment. So I'm in a meeting, I see somebody struggle, they mention a financial issue, they mention a marital issue. I can say, you know what? We have this benefit in place. That's the number one way to promote the benefit. And the number one way to get people to use the benefit is for the leader to say, I used it. And gosh, it really helped me. So like at First Son, we shoot for 100% utilization every year. And I tell people, hey, use this benefit like your vacation. Don't leave it on the table. And when I can tell people, you know what I use, heaven forbid, I don't even know what I'd do if I didn't have it. That's a powerful way to get people to use the EAP or whatever resource you have in place. And then the last two things here are things that I want to point out because you know, you can put a benefit in place of any sort, but with leaders, they're going to get to a place that is an unknown, some sort of juncture. I guarantee you this, because in 2022, it's just like a wild west out there. So we really want services for them that they can go to to figure out how do I deal with this situation today? You know, maybe my coworkers are arguing with one another. I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Or maybe somebody is mad at somebody else <clears throat> and now they're not communicating well. I don't know what to do with that. Or this last bullet, maybe I have a really beloved employee, always, always a strong employee, but she's going through a problem with her child and she's not performing well. What do I do about that? So we want a service that can kind of step in and either coach somebody across this juncture or consult with them about what's going on. So look for that kind of thing in terms of supporting the leaders. Thank you, Maria. So we've talked about your partners at Potential. We've talked about um, bringing um, your employees to Potential and your leaders to Potential and the resources and the things to look for. So one more poll I want to, want to, to throw out for you. Um, and this is just to issues that you've heard your customers talking about. Um, there, figure out how to do this. I, might, I might, may have to skip the poll because I may have to figure out um, what's sharing that. Okay, here we go. This is the, what, what issues have you heard your employers talking about? So answer this one for me. And if there's something that's not on this list, put it in the chat, please. So migrating employees back to the office popped up yeah. in the chat. Yeah, so we're also seeing again, um, you know, as we see this, that the, um, the great resignation, the turnover and the difficulty of hiring, you know, you're hearing it, we're hearing it. I actually attended a um, HR hot seat in Greenville in the upstate a few weeks ago. And of course it was all about hiring and the difficulties that employers are having in hiring. And the fact that folks just don't want to stay if they're not getting what they need in the workplace. So, you know, in our post pandemic world, what are we looking at? When we think about the workplace organization, and this is it's a, one of the reasons this is kind of the, as we said, save the best for last, because when we think about employee assistance programs, 
so often that people do just think about employment. But the reality of it is, is that EAPs are first and foremost about the entire work organization, that workplace system. And so we have to work to get that system to potential, to be for that workplace to be its very best self as well. So we're seeing these challenges over and over again. The attendance, the customer service, the team cohesion, um, just performance and productivity, as well as culture shifts. You know, there is a new social contract out there between the work organization, the employers, as well as its employees. Employees don't want to work as hard as they once did, and they won't, don't want to work as many hours. So how does an employer get their job done, get the product out when the employees don't want to work? So you have to really begin to look at systemic change and how that systemic change can happen. And in that, it has to be working with the workplace leaders, the, the employees, as well as looking at what does that culture look like and what has to change um, and how might a well-being partner help with that. So what are some smart moves that employers can make? Again, it comes down to benefits and really understanding the benefits that they're purchasing. You know, it's maybe great that the benefit in your dental plan has an embedded employee assistance program, but to really understand how is that EAP going to help my work organization? Is it just going to help my employees or is it going to help the entire work organization? Especially if there's a crisis um, or something where, um, Folks have got to come together and really work. But also the promotion of benefits and for their employers to really talk about the offerings and how the benefit offerings can really help employees be at potential. And that may be short-term, long-term disability. It may be um, dental or vision, or it may be EAP. But again, as Maria said, one of the best things that a work organization can do is to invest in its leaders, to really understand the leaders that are there and what they need to be their very best. Again, the other is for that work organization to look at its culture, to understand how their employees fit into the culture. Um, and what they need, and to be able to give them organizational direction. It means communicating the mission, vision, and values in so many ways um, to employees, but also for that organization to really live up to its values and to have the employees expected to meet those values in everything they do. And lastly, that is, you know, looking at where the culture can be improved what needs to happen within that work organization so that it becomes an organization where people want to come work and want to do their best and want to really work at potential. So those are the things that employers need to do. So as we think about the road to post-pandemic success, you know, we're looking at partners. We're looking at the folks that you as benefit consultants are wanting to work with but also who you're recommending for your customers, but also helping customers to know what's the right match for them. We're looking at employees. We're looking at the services that are offered to employees from different modalities and how they might be able to access services and get what they need. You know, we're looking at leaders. We're looking at leaders growing and really being the ones to lead those well-being efforts. Um, and then lastly, we've looked at the organizations at potential. Um, how can that work organization be its very best culture for those folks that they hire and retain and to be able to get the product that they are doing out? So what do they need to do? And how might a well-being partner help with that. So it's about skills, it's about communication, it's about 
access to resources. So this is kind of where we are now and, and where we want to go. So as we conclude this, would love to know, did we meet your expectations? What are you going to take away from this? So throw it in the chat for us just to see, you know, is there one thing that you want to take away? You know, at First Sun AAP, you know, we want to be the, the, the well-being partner that leads everyone to be at potential. But we're also not the right fit for everyone. You know, this is not meant to be, you know, a sales song and dance, but we're more than happy to do that for you. Um, you know, we're partners, and it's really at the core of what we do. We want to, to be accessible and responsible and responsive to your needs and where we are. So please let us know what you need from us. Um, I will actually send a PDF of these slides out so you'll have the contact information. Our request a quote link is there um, as well as our website. And I will, um, if you did not get the email from me yesterday with the affidavit, that is again for credit for South Carolina um, folks that we want you to be able um, to get credit and I will get those loaded. I need to learn how to do it for North Carolina. So if you can help me know that, then I will try to get those in for North Carolina. Um, we also are gonna record, we've recorded this. So with the link, I will send that link out and I'm gonna be sending out some more information. Our president's letter from Maria is hot off the press that would love for you to see that, um, as well as an article um, that uh, actually I co-wrote um, with um, an HR person from Benefit Administrators or Benefit um, Advisors Network that went out in the IFEBP Benefits Magazine. But would love for you just to be able to see that as well. But we want to continue to partner with you to, to be present to help you as a consultant, reach your potential. So in whatever way we can help you do that, we will do that. I know we've gone over our hour and I apologize for that, but I thank you for hanging on. And um, just again, if you wanna throw things in the chat, but I'm gonna stop recording now and if I can figure out where the recording button is um, and be, I bid you adieu. So thank you for your Wednesday lunchtime and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.